Uh, thank you very much for bringing me here and being able to talk about this uh, kind of research that we do. Um, and also, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm not sure that this breadth in species has to do with any scientific plan. It's probably just a lack of focus. And the other thing I'd like to say, Jonathan and I had a very interesting talk. And I'd like to um, thank Jonathan for the exchange of ideas. And I think we come up with a very good solution for it. So what I'm trying to tell you today is a genomics of extinct and endangered species. And I think it is this uh, attempt that if you have the opportunity to look back and study populations from a long time ago, also because this gives you the ability to work with populations that have a similar a generation time as we have as the investigators, and then make predictions on what we possibly could learn for endangered species in the future. If you would uh, think about this from learning from history, I think we are probably not very optimistic because um, we have seen that mankind has not done so. Nevertheless, we would like to do what is biology of extinction, and this is studying waves of extinction that happened. Most of us would assume that, for example, mammoth went extinct only a single time, but it's actually not true. Mammoths went extinct three times. 45,000 years ago, a group of mammoths, we didn't even know that uh, were there. And the good news for us is, as a species, we had nothing to do with it, because at the time mammoths went extinct, there were no people living in this uh, north northern parts of Siberia, which were only populated beginning 22, 23,000 years ago. So the big extinction we all know about is the one uh, 10,000 years ago that also killed off the woolly rhino and other megafauna. And then the last one were the last standing mammoth on Wrangell Island, three and a half thousand years ago, the time when the Egyptians were building the pyramids, there were still mammoths around, so we, in a way, we barely missed them. This is different from the moa, where we absolutely had a role in it. It was not only a very big bird, it was also a very delicious bird. And all that was left pretty much uh, a few hundred years after the Polynesian came to New Zealand, they completely chewed up the entire population. The last example for an extinction is the Silocene, which is also the only species I can offer you a photograph of. It went extinct in 1936, and it's a prime example for the carelessness of society. They put out a bounty of $1,000 for every um, uh, Silocene Tasmanian tiger that got shot, and they kept very accurate um, invoices for that. And so within just a few years, 2,200 of those bounties were paid. And this being a top-level predator, I think it's clear that this was the entire population. So from this, we want to learn from this experience, ho hopefully, uh, how we can uh, prevent extinction for the Tasmanian devil, which is, I put here, uh, 10 years uh, from now is when uh, it might be extinct with the dwindling population numbers, and of course, very similar for the polar bear that is also with the climate change after the threat of extinction. This one is this um, mysterious omics term um, that we have come up with. It's the combination of the museum and the genomics. It's not sequencing your muse, your favorite muse. It's the museomics and the genomics. And I'll show you a nice example for that afterwards. And then we want to go over to the um, endangered species. And before we start, we want to look at the population structure and the biological diversity. And this is pretty much the key interest that we have in this. And if I say we, all of the work that I have done has always involved, uh, involved Webb Miller, who is my very close collaborator. So historically speaking, a lot of the diversity was assessed only by sequencing a few hundred base pairs from the cytochrome B gene and the D-loop from a mitochondria. And then population genetics was based on that. And I will hope to hopefully convince you that this is not enough in many instances. It is much better to work with unilinear markers, complete, my, uh, complete mitochondrial genomes. And even in this day and age where we can sequence complete genomes within a week, I still think there is a lot to be learned from uh, studying mitochondria. You will not believe how many species are out there that have no information on their mitochondrial genome sequences by chromosomal markers. And then in the end, I also want to show you um, genome-wide markers uh, for establishing population structure. So this is my Bio 101 slide, 
where I try to rem uh, I want you to remember there are two copies of the nuclear chromosome, very large one, and the reason that the mitochondria for ancient DNA is uh, of so much interest, you have a thousand copy numbers per cell, and not only that, because the mitochondria has its own membrane system in the cell, um, its degradation in the ground on, uh, after an individual died is very, very different from the nuclear genome where you also have apoptotic processes that are degrading uh, the chromosomes directly and in the end you might end up with uh, more than 10,000 copies of the mitochondria than any copy of a chromosome. The second beginning a parameter is I want to give you an overview over um, the genetic diversity of a population. What you see here is 20 randomly sampled Europeans. And this is a view um, that where we show the entire genome and every vertical bar is a SNP marker in the genome. And if you are of European descendant and you're sitting to your neighbor, on average you have about 20 of those changes pairwise. And because now with all this interest in sequencing human genomes, we have become the model system. And let's use for the rest of the talk these 20 differences as a relative marker, as a proxy to assessing the diversity of the other species that uh, we work with. 2005, very important year. This is when um, Eddie Rubin here and his uh, colleagues uh, published the uh, cave bear genome. And this was the first step where people were um, going after not the uh, mitochondrial sequences, but the nuclear sequences. This was still done with uh, Sanger and it got about 27 KB. In the same year, we used the 454 um, sequence uh, to sequence a mammoth, and we roughly got a 500 to 1,000 fold uh, information from the nuclear genome. And at the same time, it became clear that the short read length at the time was a perfect match for the highly fragmented DNA from ancient samples. In 2008, then, uh, we also demonstrated by sequencing the complete genome of the mammoth uh, to about one-fold coverage that the redundance that comes from this approach helps you to overcome a lot of the errors. And so we came up with this new credo that it is, if you feel rich enough, it is possible um, to create uh, ancient genomes that are of a similar quality or the same quality of a modern sample. But of course, it takes a lot of time and effort. And so this is a thousand-fold coverage of a mammoth mitochondria that you can see here. And you can be relatively sure that this is being sequenced correctly because the damage allele that we see in the, uh, in the DNA is roughly 1 to 2 percent depending on the storage history. So you can, with a 50-fold coverage, you can completely rule out that you have um, of wrong alleles due to damage. Of course, this has become, in 2005, uh, was uh, when we could sequence 20 MB, and it cost about, in 2006, it cost about $36,000 to produce a complete mammoth mitochondria. Many of our reviewers thought that was way too expensive. We never thought that uh, cost was a factor in peer review, but apparently it is. And now in uh, 2010, we can sequence the complete genome of such an animal with, uh, within a month, pretty much, using the uh, HiSeq from the Illumina. The second breakthrough that really made this field possible is that we stayed away from uh, the traditional source of ancient DNA, which is bone. And we, uh, unlike what they tell you on CSI, you don't need to have a hair with a follicle to catch the bad guy. There also is a lot of DNA in the hair shaft. And we made this a pretty much our most important uh, assets that we decontaminate. You would not believe how many mammoth hair I have shampooed in my life. <laughs> and uh, rinse it with water. And in the end, we put on bleach on the outside, not to make the mammoth blonde, but to uh, decontaminate the environmental DNAs. And then this leads to a very high, so the DNA, the endogenous DNA, stays encased like in a, in a biological plastic. And then afterwards, we come and dissolve it and get uh, quite pure fractions. And I will show you this in a minute. Once you understood that this is a good source of DNA, we were amazed just how many samples there were. And the museums were very, very interested in uh, providing samples. For this one, for example, they sent the last hair that they had on a mammoth. And so we were instantly capable of now producing a population study on an extinct animal. 
And in a way, it was amazing to see that even today, as we speak, there is a single mitochondrial genome for an African elephant, only two mitochondrial sequences for Indian elephant, and the extinct elephant now already has uh, 18 of those mitochondria. If you just look at this graph, you can immediately see that uh, three of the individuals are standing out. And within those three, you can see they're again very similar. So this is a group of mammoths. That's the group of mammoths that died out 45,000 years ago. And the other animals that you can see here are the ones that uh, went extinct in uh, 10,000 years ago. The orange bar that you always see is what you would have learned if you used this uh, approach by sequencing the hypervariable region of the mitochondria, which is quite limited. And the word of warning, what you're seeing here, if you think that is a good diversity, it is the accumulated diversity over 50,000 years, and which of course meant that the mammoth in itself had a very low diversity. And this is one of these paradigms that we are following as you move towards uh, extinction and exiting uh, that your um, diversity uh, is in decline, and this becomes then one of the factors that you can assess the status of a species. If you do a Bayesian analysis, you can see these are the three individuals. This is the other group, the clade one, the clade two, as they are called now, and they had a population split time of one and a half million years, which was um, questioned very, very highly. People were saying there's a freak accident of uh, the maternal lineage, and then in 2008, when we sequenced uh, one animal that was clade one and one animal that was uh, clade two. So the younger one being about uh, 18,000 years old and the older one being almost 60,000 years old. Uh, this one we could perfectly decontaminate and we were sequencing roughly 90% of the DNA that we sequenced came from the mammoth. If we then went back and we looked at the clade information also in the nuclear genome, that split of these two populations held up about three times uh, what it would take in the uh, primate lineage for the Neanderthal and the human genome. And we thought this was quite interesting. And this is um, why some of the museums are interested. If you just look at the anatomical data that you would have for the different mammals that it would have been found, the two groups would have never been uh, identified. So the morphological information is not enough to make this distinction. But I think it is very important uh, for the understanding. And now as we go on, there is even more groups of mammoths that are popping up. And I want to stop the mammoths on here. If you're more interested, we have a website that has all kinds of information. And so this is just a fantastic um, tool for also outreach. Uh, people kind of question whether the combination of mammoths and hair was just a very lucky incident and whether our hair approach would also work with other systems. And I now want to show you uh, very briefly uh, that this is the case. This is one of the most difficult ancient DNA projects, even so that this is very young. This is just maybe 100 years or 150 year old specimens. But for the storage history of those samples, people were never successful or hardly ever successful in getting DNA out of a Tasmanian tiger. And then working with the Smithsonian, we sampled um, uh, this uh, uh, taxidermically uh, treated um, specimen. And after we take our hair out, you can't even see where we took it. So this is almost like non-invasive sampling. This is why the museums really love this. And unlike coming with a chisel and taking a, a sample out of a skull. And in the instance of that uh, one on the right, this was shoved into ethanol after it died in the London Zoo in 1880. And we just lowered the pipette to the ground of the char and we sucked up all the hair that had fallen from the carcass and it was enough to get uh, my two complete mitochondrial sequences. And you can see again, if you look in that region, in the hypervariable region, you would have found nothing. And overall, there were five differences. Now that we have those results, the museums are sending us a large number of samples. There are roughly 800 uh, different specimens preserved from Tasmanian a tiger and you can now uh, do a very nice population genetic study. So again, there's a website for that if you're interested. Um, this is the individual in the Smithsonian. There was a female that was shipped to the US when it was pregnant. One cup died early on and the other one made it to adulthood and we uh, were uh, sequencing all three of them. Um, next example, how this is working is for the MOA. So by just uh, taking um, eggshells and taking DNA from the eggshell, 
we could produ uh, produce uh, microsatellite markers in a work together with Mike Bunce from Australia and those markers were enough to sort out all the radiation of the reptiles in, uh, uh, for the MOA in New Zealand. Last example, um, woolly rhino. It was always believed that the woolly rhino breached from the Indian uh, rhino, but we could show that this is actually closer together with the Sumatran rhino. And again, making my point about the museums, even so, uh, five out of the six rhinos that you see here are still extant and very endangered. It would have been almost impossible for us to get samples. And it was much easier to go to the museum and just take a very small sample from a horn and a hoof, and we could do our research and get going. So, which tissue? Of course, there's many more bones because bones last longer, um, but also this tissue that you have sometimes does not reseal uh, in good DNA. But if you use uh, hair, horn, or hooves, then uh, you have an excellent chance if you take it out of the keratin. I would have added a feather, but feather doesn't start with an H, so I left it uh, off the list here. So, going to museomics. This is the famous um, Adams mammoth that was discovered in 1799 by Michael Adams. It's almost like today. Um, there was the news that this uh, animal has been found and he had to round up the funds. He had to convince the Tsar to give him money to go to Siberia. It took him three uh, years to get there. He dug out everything. To date, it's still the most complete mammoth ever found. He brought it back. It took three years and it arrived as a big stinking mass in St. Petersburg. And together with all the bones and, and, and the material that they found, they also recovered 36 pounds of hair. And the Russians were um, gracious enough to send us 0.1 gram of that hair. <laughs> and that hair has been stored in a Russian museum in a drawer for 200 years. Uh, no climate control, nothing. And from this 0.1 gram of hair that we had, we got the complete genome uh, or mitochondrial genome. And this is really what gave us this uh, idea of the concept about museum genomics, because now it is uh, possible also, and this is our big goal, to attach sequencing information with the type specimens in the museums. And the type specimens are the ones where the binomial um, Linnaean name is associated with. This is like the holy grail of a museum specimen and to our surprise, the museums are now even willing to let us touch this very, very precious ones, and then we can associate, for example, complete mitochondria with them. Moving on to the modern species, but first, again, looking back, um, polar bears, polar bear fossils are extremely rare because usually the um, bears die over sea ice. They could be ruptured into pieces by the colleagues. Whatever is left is sinking down to the ground. And we were lucky enough by working with a group in Oslo um, that um, this mandible and this canine tooth was recovered and it was dated 110 to 130,000 years. We succeeded in getting a complete mitochondria from it here. And so this is the oldest reliably sequenced DNA with a lot of coverage. And to make a long story short, it has uh, it shares alleles with a small group of brown bears, but it also shares allele with modern polar bears. And from an uh, isotope analysis, we know that this bear already fed like a marine species, so it was a true polar bear. And this now allowed us to show that the polar bears did not derive from the brown bears and the grizzlies, but from that small group of ABC brown bears in southern Alaska and that this is then branching off to the polar bears. And so the question was, when did it happen? When was the speciation of the polar bear? There were estimates from five to six million years, and other people were saying it had to happen after uh, the last ice age, so the shortest estimate was uh, 10,000 years. And we could show by phylogenetic analysis that this happened 150,000 years, and if you ever wondered whether there was this fossil that is like a transition state fossil, and I think it's this one because it is, is pretty much 20,000 years younger than what we can show for the population split time. And this is again putting it into perspective of um, the primate lineage or the, the, the human lineage. And pretty much you can say the polar bear is a species on the same time scale as a modern human, 150 to 200,000 years. 
what was uh, a prob uh, problematic for us to publish this because suddenly the climate uh, researchers took a lot of offense in what we had to say. And this had to do with the fact that so the uh, yellow uh, peaks here is when the climate was warming up. And suddenly we realized that the polar bear had arisen too early for our understanding because there was this thermal intercline about 45,000 years ago. And so it meant that at least this uh, polar bear population has made it through a warming period already. And so the question is then uh, whether the polar bear would go extinct again uh, now that the weather is warm. And of course, this is nothing we can answer from our data, but we can show that it is possible to collect molecular genetic data on the time scale of, let's say, 130 to 150,000 years. And I like to finish my talk by uh, telling you about the Tasmanian devil. The Tasmanian devil uh, was still on the mainland about 1,300 years ago. Then the true devils arrived in about 1800 when the European colonists came in. They hunted the devils. They got the silocene extinct. Then after the silocene was extinct, people realized maybe it wasn't such a great idea to kill them all off. They put them under protection. All should have been good. If not, in 1996, this photograph uh, uh, was published where you saw a facial cancer disease. And first it was believed to come from uh, a virus, but then it was shown to be a skin graft. It was shown to be infectious. So just by mating, by biting, by fighting, those animals infect one another. It's 100% lethality within four months. And just by 2006, about 60% of the population had declined. And in 2008, the animal was now classified as endangered. And this is now a great example how conservation biology works. While the disease was just in this area here and a short fence could have been built and to separate the infected animals from the remaining pool, people were talking, talking, talking. And then in 2003, this is where the fence would have been built in 2007. And as we speak, the disease has arrived in the last uninfected population. And so now the entire population is at risk. So we decided what we learned from the mammoth to apply to the Tasmanian devil. And we sampled the entire island, and we have uh, about uh, 50 of the animals. We sequenced, this is the Tasmanian of the year in 2010, Cedric, uh, because he survived an experiment where he got experimentally infected with this cancer disease, and he survived two of those infections. The third round of infection, he faltered because he was not challenged before. And we compared this with a Tasmanian devil that had succumbed to the disease. Same approach, going back. This is Cedric in the west. This is the group in the east. And you can see in the east, there's many of them, there's absolutely no difference in the mitochondrial genomes. And overall, you have about 15 differences here. But then using old samples from the museums, we could show that the biological diversity has not been impacted by the disease so far. And that this low genetic diversity that we see has prevailed at least for the last 150 years. Sequence the complete genome on uh, 454 and also on Illumina. Uh, half of the data was produced using this new XL Plus uh, technology where we get 750 base pair reads. Why did we have to do this? The next uh, available reference genome is about 25 million years away. And so this is one of those instances we first had to de novo assemble a genome before we could call the variants from the uh, two Illumina sequences that we had and then produce the genetic marker. And this is then the assembly. So we are almost as good as a, a middle quality Sanger genome where we have about 11 KB and 50 contexts. So the goal now was to produce a genotyping assay from these two sequences that we had. First, 192 candidates. Later, we opted to 1536. Uh, we tested 175 animals, and we did a complete population structure. And this is now another amazing lesson to be learned. Can you believe it? One of the attractions that we wanted to work with that system was that there was a breeding program underway. But what they had done is they had taken only animals from this group here, which was a tiny portion of the biological diversity that's out there. And the entire rest of the remaining biological diversity would have been lost. And so we now can come up with a structure along the island. And this now, in theory, would allow to put together this project ARC, where 500 animals are needed. We could calculate that the entire genetic diversity could be contained in as little as four animals. 
but of course it needs to be the right animals. And what we're trying to say, in an instance like that, genotype all the animals, bring the right breeding partners together, and this was an idea that was not uh, welcomed at all by some of the conservational efforts that were underway, and so there was a raging war between informed breeding and random breeding. And of course we believe that informed breeding is a much better idea. I'd like to close by giving you the overview. So this is all the species for which there are more than a single mitochondria are available in the database of the uh, mammalian species. And if you are European human, this is where you stand with roughly about 20. And you can see stellar sea lion, bison that went back to 150 individuals, Tasmanian um, devil, Tasmanian tiger. So the right side of the graph is where the uh, genetic diversity is very low. So we Europeans, we are many, but we're not terribly diverse compared to a Bushman, a genome that we sequenced in uh, last year, which have very few people left, but a very large diversity. And so, in a way, you would, for example, not expect that even the endangered panda has about three times the maternal diversity that uh, a European human would have. This now lets us uh, conclude that three things matter when it comes to avoiding extinctions and they are habitat, habitat, habitat. This is the most important factor that the species go extinct because as long as you don't provide the space, it will not work. But at the same time, what good does it do if you have 50,000 elephants left and they're all of the same genetic makeup? A single sweep of a disease will just wipe them out as we are seeing right now with the Tasmanian devil. And for this reason, we propose that genetic diversity should become a marker in this and would allow you to assess. A beautiful uh, example for that is the large whales. It pretty much looks that all this whaling that happened in the last 150 years or so uh, was the first uh, major bottleneck through which those animals went and the populations would have been long gone if they would not have this enormous remaining biological diversity. But now, of course, if a second bottleneck comes in, uh, this population is gone as well. So genetics can help to prevent extinctions, and I think this is the mantra that we do. Um, many thanks to the Moore Foundation, who has supported this work uh, early on. Roche has uh, con contributed a lot. Then these are the museum collaborators, as they are, it's all museum curators and then for the polar bear work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stefan. Questions? What's the controversy with the, uh, with the, with the breeders? What would they prefer to do? Just they, they believe they can look at an animal and make a better choice than us genotyping the genome. I think this is, in essence, it. They believe that uh, if you do informed breeding, you put your own uh, perceptions about what is good in there. And they believe they have a better chance not knowing how to put them and just to give a random chance. And we believe that um, maximizing biological diversity is what you need in order to guarantee the survival of a population that's already dwindling. Yeah. Jim. So on your last slide, you showed the Bushman and the human, or not the last slide, but near the end. Um, and I, I, yeah, Bushman and European human, right. Okay, so I recall hearing Spencer Wells talk about the Deep Ancestry Project, and he shows about 90% of the existing variation in humans still residing in populations in Africa and the rest of the world only about 10%. Now I know he's sampling different genes and m more populations than you show here, but it's kind of the same order of magnitude. And can one infer this kind of... I th I, I'm afraid I just heard a talk uh, by Andy Clark from Cornell. And I'm afraid it seems this is way more complicated than we all have thought. Uh, overall, if you look at maternal haplogroups, there are 38 human haplogroups and only two of the 38 human haplogroups are outside Africa. And I think this is pretty much referring to what you're saying right now. At the same time, it seems that the number of variants in the pool is rapidly expanding with a growing population size. 
And uh, within the last 2,000 years, the human population has gone from 10 min million individuals, let's be generous, to 10 billion. And this increase in population, rapid increase in population, has dramatically increased also the mutation rate. We're not only outbred, we're also uh, vastly accumulating a number of variants. And so I think a lot of the diversity that we are measuring today has nothing to do with the uh, natural history of our species, but it's just a uh, product of this uh, population explosion. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, David Gilbert, do we have plans for the buses? Does everybody know what to do next? There, are, there will be buses leaving presently to uh, take us to JGI where there will be a reception and a poster session and tours available of both the uh, Lumina High Seek and the Pac Bio. And I'd like to thank uh, Stefan and all the speakers.